Welcome to the Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Billy Joe and Nora with Down in the Willow Garden. On this week's show, I'm going to talk about a recent paper that I uh, saw before Christmas, and I had to write to the author and request the paper from her because it was in a journal that I didn't have access to, and I think um, that's something actually I might talk about at some point on the show kind of the difference between the journals that just everyday people can get access to and those that are only available to people who are at certain institutions that subscribe. And unfortunately, I was shut out of this one because we don't have a subscription uh, in our household. But luckily, uh, the author was very nice, and she sent me the paper right over, and I was able to read it over the holiday, and now I finally have had a chance to work it into the show. And actually, I've also written a blog post about it that you can find online if you kind of want the quick and dirty version and you don't have time to listen to all of today's show. And of course, the online version also comes with some pretty pictures to illustrate the, the major points. Now this study is interesting to me because I am um, I'm really into the idea of creating spaces that can be used by both people and also by wildlife. And the idea that we can take spaces that we think of as having one purpose and actually find a way to uh, just put one or two little features in here and suddenly give them a whole new purpose as well. And in this case, uh, garden spaces, or as they're called in this particular study, which was done in the U.S., yard spaces, um, you know, these are places that we often consider as being for human consumption. It's where we have play sets for our children, or where we let the dog out to run, or the cat to have a bit of a stroll, or where we go to sit or grow food. But actually, because those spaces often involve grass and trees and shrubs and other sorts of plants, they can provide habitat for wildlife as well. And so this particular study was looking at whether the habitat that these places create is useful to various species of birds. And if so, what aspects of that habitat are useful. And the nice thing about the study was that it wasn't just looking at these things in isolation, but thinking about whole neighborhoods worth of yards, and also thinking about those neighborhoods uh, in conjunction with nearby preserves. So really the question being asked is whether, you know, if we have places that we know that wildlife are already attracted to, so preserves or parks or other large areas of space kind of within an urban matrix, can we also consider the fact that nearby kind of incidental green spaces, so maybe medians uh, or little plots of land that are in between a sidewalk and the road, or, or little spaces like that that are just kind of dotted around, can those all add up together and also collectively uh, have a positive impact on the wildlife and kind of extend their potential habitat outside the range of just the, the boundary of the preserves? And I figured that this would be an interesting topic to a lot of folks here in Britain because you are all very enthusiastic about gardens, uh, probably even more so than people in the U.S. And so many of you are already cultivating a lot of features that are purposely wildlife friendly. So to hear about what those efforts might actually be yielding out in your yard and to hear about a few more things that you might be able to do to further improve that space is something that I thought some of you might find interesting. Now, all of this study was actually done, as I think I might have said already, in the Chicago area. And of course, Chicago is a bit more built up than around here in, in the Penryn and Falmouth area. But uh, kind of urban and disturbed areas like that, all across the spectrum, whether it's kind of just a little village all the way up to a city, we know that these spaces are highly um, modified by humans. They might have cement and buildings and various other adjustments that we've made. And yet, they can still be quite useful despite all of this variation that we've made to the natural habitat for conserving biodiversity and also reconnecting with nature. These areas can harbor species that are of conservation concern, they can also provide homes for endemic species that aren't found elsewhere, and they can provide a habitat matrix and also corridors between various spaces. So if we've got um, a major preserve over in the west and another major one in the east and you've got a big city in the middle, that actually uh, may not completely separate those two preserves if there are little patches kind of spotted here and there throughout the city that, that the animals can use to hop from one to another kind of in a stepping stone fashion and get to the preserve on the other side. So we know that these can actually have really important ecological functions even though there are lots of people in them uh, and human objects and buildings as well. Now often, despite all of this, 
The potential of urban matrix is ignored in planning efforts and when people sit down to think about what they need to do to help species or to change something about the ecology of an area, they are thinking about uh, parks and they're thinking about preserves and they're thinking about much larger bodies. They aren't considering all the little bits and pieces and the stuff that is under the control of private landowners, especially that stuff that's on the scale of a yard or a garden that's not really big. So residential yards can make up over 30% of a city's land area and so obviously this could be actually quite an important type of land when you are considering land uses. And it could offer a vital space for wildlife and also opportunities for what a lot of researchers are now calling reconciliation ecology or these kind of um, ecological, sociological sorts of uh, philosophical interactions between people and the habitat around them and when they're in these spaces kind of becoming more interested in and connected to wildlife and so therefore starting to care more about the ecosystem and potentially do more to help it out. And despite all this, the role of yards has still been relatively poorly studied among scientists. We don't really know how the characteristics of neighboring yards affect wildlife. So that we, we do know kind of on the scale of one yard what is having an effect, but when you start to add those up and put them into a whole neighborhood, what is the impact? If, if you've got one type of yard uh, next to one house and another type of yard next door, what if those kind of cancel each other out? So one is kind of bird friendly and the other isn't, so maybe on the whole you don't see a lot of birds in the neighborhood. But what if you've got a bunch of yards in a row that are all bird friendly? Or you've got a balance where bird friendliness outweighs bird unfriendliness. Does this kind of um, extend the habitat so that in general that overwhelming majority of bird friendly places kind of trumps the other ones and you do see a bit more uh, wildlife activity. These are the sorts of questions that haven't really been asked yet or been answered. And researchers are also interested in thinking about what is the relative importance of yards versus other types of surrounding landscapes. We know that species respond to landscape at a range of spatial scales and so decisions that are made in individual yards could influence the overall effect of the neighborhood and also multiple neighborhoods together can impact the effect of the entire city. So uh, if you kind of look at things on multiple scales together you can begin to understand at what level do we start to have influences on the wildlife and does this mean that actually individual people, you as a landowner, you as a gardener, can begin to have an effect or do you have to wait on a bunch of people to work together maybe because the city passed a law. So obviously you can begin to see how this area of research could be quite empowering in a lot of ways if it does find that individual people can make important contributions. And really this question is all about thinking of bottom-up versus top-down influences. Bottom-up indicates the combined effect of local decisions made at individual or household scale levels. So for example, um, the number of bird feeders is usually influenced by uh, the individuals within a, a home. So you decide whether or not you're going to have a bird feeder in your yard, your neighbor does the same, that neighbor does the same, and so on and so forth all the way down the road. And so. Um, because of all of your collective decisions, your neighborhood ends up having maybe 20 bird feeders instead of just a few. And that's because all of you guys independently decided you wanted to put a bird feeder in your yard. On the other hand, top down indicates the influence of decisions that are made by government entities. So for example, in this case, you might say that the amount of open space that is going to be found within a landscape might be a top down decision because you've got some governmental body, maybe um, an individual person or a whole panel of people, they get together and they decide that you need to have 70% uh, open space to 30% built up space. Now that would be fantastic. I think probably most places uh, would turn that around and make it the opposite. But let's say that's the case. And so because of that kind of planning level decision, you have a lot of people that might want to build something but they can't because the government has decided you can only have a certain amount of space that's built up and the rest has to be open. And so that is a top-down decision that's been made and it's usually the city or the county level agencies that are um, going to impact that. Now a recent review of studies on urban bird assemblages suggested that local habitat factors may actually be more important than broader landscape factors in terms of 
influencing the presence and absence of certain species. So this means that uh, there is some support for the idea that these bottom-up influences could be quite important. Now in the past I've talked a little bit about how individual residential yards can provide uh, very important resources for wildlife. We know that these are places where you can find spots to nest, spots to feed, uh, spots to roost, places to hide from predators, a whole bunch of things like that. And we also know that even within those categories, so for example, um, feeding sites, there can be variations. So if you've got something that's a native plant versus a non-native plant, if you've got something that's at a certain level uh, above the ground versus on the ground, all these things can have implications for how many species and what species are going to come in and utilize those features. Native plants, of course, tend to improve richness because species have evolved with those things and so have relationships and want those specific plants and those uh, specific insects that are found on those plants and they're used to the patterns of when those plants are flowering and coming into leaf and going through their uh, annual cycle of variation. Also we tend to find that places with multiple canopy layers when you've got lots of shrub cover and, and also a tall canopy can be quite useful because this has quite a lot of environmental variation and it's catering to um, both the things that like to be down on the ground and kind of furtive, but also the things that like to be way up high. So if you've got lots of these sorts of layers, then you're going to improve the habitat and make it appealing to many different species and not just one or two types of the extremes. All of this can improve richness, and richness is really important, as I've mentioned actually quite recently on the show, for um, providing stability of the habitat, for allowing it to uh, perform more ecosystem functions for allowing it to recover after it's been through uh, various disturbances. So richness is quite useful and also it's just enjoyable for us if we go outdoors and see lots of different species that's exciting, it's interesting, and it tends to get people more enthusiastic about nature and maintaining nature. Uh, more vegetation in general is one factor that can increase biodiversity and also where you've got many yards aggregated together we know that there tends to be greater habitat connectivity, so from one yard to the next, and interaction with neighboring spaces, and then this can improve richness as well, because all those, again, kind of have that stepping stone effect, where you can uh, spread the amount of space that is available to be utilized, and therefore pack more things in. Now the current study is the first to investigate the aggregated effects of many yard-scale decisions, including both front and backyards, uh, of these homes in the U.S. at key locations near urban forest preserves. And in particular, the study was designed to ask a couple of questions. Number one is what is the relative importance of groups of yards, so in other words, bottom-up influences, in explaining the variation in na native bird species richness outside forest preserves that are found within uh, the city of Chicago. Secondly, the study was designed to think about which specific yard decisions, when implemented by multiple households within a neighborhood, could affect bird species richness. So which factors and features were important for uh, creating an environment that birds wanted to use. And thirdly, how do different species of bird groups, so things that are migratory versus things that are year-round residents, things that are native versus non-natives, how do these respond to the different influences? And is there a variation from one category to the next, such that you could think about uh, deliberately influencing these factors in order to enhance a particular type of bird group? Now that is all of the background that you need to know in order to understand uh, the methodology and the results of the study. So I'll give you a bit of a break to absorb all of that, and then I'll come back and think about what the researchers actually did in order to investigate these questions. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Joni Madden with Down by the Sally Gardens. In case you're just joining us, I will remind you that on today's show we're talking about a recent study looking into uh, the aggregated effects of individual yards on bird richness in uh, Chicago. And the researchers were interested in thinking about uh, whether individual landowners could do things to their yards, or gardens as you would say here, in order to encourage uh, bird richness in the area and kind of extend 
the usefulness of nearby preserves and kind of extend their boundaries in a way by creating spaces that the birds would want to use within these individual gardens outside of the nearby preserve. So the Chicago metropolitan area is in Cook County, Illinois, and Chicago is the third most populous city in the U.S., which obviously means that uh, it, it, you know if you can find positive impacts in this sort of densely packed area with lots of people and lots of disturbance, then that probably is a very positive sign for other areas, uh, such as the ones that we live in here in Cornwall that tend to be less built up. And you could think that it, you know if Chicago has that many people, those many buildings, that much activity, and they can have some um, good pockets of bird richness, then surely in other towns and villages this is a possible thing as well. And what's interesting about Chicago is, despite the fact that it's so huge and full of people, it still has about 70,000 acres of forest preserves, which is actually quite impressive. That's a lot of green space within that metropolitan area. And many of these preserves are riparian corridors, which means that they are um, kind of stretches of land that surround either side of a river. And they are adjacent to major rivers and tributaries in the Chicago area. So basically what you've got is kind of a strip of water and then on either side of that a little bit of a, a vegetated buffer zone. And then outside of that you'll have the, uh, the built up areas and the neighborhoods that are being studied. And in particular, there were 25 transect sites that the authors focused on here. So they found where these riparian corridors were, and then within a certain amount of distance, they found uh, transect sites that could be studied uh, as little collections of yards. And these transect sites were selected in residential areas that were um, along the north branch of the Chicago River, or the Des Plaines River, or the tributaries of those two rivers. Now each transect began a hundred meters from the edge of a forest preserve and then extended about one kilometer outward into the adjacent neighborhood. And the one kilometer distance was selected because it encompassed what people have previously hypothesized to be kind of the spillover area of the preserves. So we know that of course there are animals living in the preserves, and in this case birds that we're, we're focusing on, and they tend to go about um, 500 meters out uh, around the, the borders of the, uh, the preserve area. And these guys were actually extending that a bit because they thought, well, if, if the birds are spilling out at least 500 meters, then maybe if these yards are really good habitat, they might be found uh, even, even farther abroad. And so they've created this really big area around the preserves just to make sure they are encompassing that full area where the birds might li be likely to fly out and, and use the space for nesting or for feeding or for whatever it is that they need to do. Now within the residential areas that were investigated there were fluctuations in demographic and also geographical characteristics. So for example there were variations in median household income which ranged from about $45,000 a year to $191,000 a year. Uh, there are variations in housing density, so from 16 to 77 homes, and also variations in canopy cover from 20 to 46 percent. And this is kind of interesting because there have been previous studies that have shown that there are socioeconomic factors that can really influence the quality of um, vegetation and habitat around people's homes, and also therefore the amount of biodiversity that those gardens uh, and yards can support. And there was an interesting study that I read that actually is cited in this paper as well about uh, Phoenix, Arizona and how places that are poorer tend to have less vegetation, they tend to have fewer species. There also tends to be poorer health in these areas and um, poor mental health as well, so both physical and mental health. And all these things seem to be connected. And an another uh, variation was kind of the microhabitat as well, where you have less water and less vegetation you tend also to have uh, higher temperatures and it's less comfortable to live as well. So uh, the fact that this particular study incorporated all these different types of neighborhoods is actually really good because we know that there can be quite a lot of variation from one type of neighborhood to another. And of course, if you've got something ranging from uh, 45,000 to 191,000 in terms of median household income, that is thinking about kind of the poorer neighborhoods all the way up to you know some some pretty wealthy people who likely have very large yards with lots of fancy features and, and landscapers and, uh, and 
people to help them out to make the garden a really big and, and nice place. So hopefully this kind of gives a, a broad idea across all these types of places and averages that out so that we can think, um, you know, this is maybe a baseline and things could actually get even better in terms of the effects on richness. So one of the first things they did was estimate bird species richness. This is kind of the fundamental thing that they were after here. And in this case, richness equals the number of species that were present on a particular transect. So not uh, on a yard by yard basis, but across the entire transect, how many bird species were seen collectively throughout all of the yards. And bird surveys were conducted twice during the peak breeding season in the summer of 2012. And this was done by conducting five minute point counts at every 100 meters along the transect. So the observer would start at the beginning of the transect, which is just, which is just a line that goes through all of the different um, areas that were being studied. They would stop and listen and look to see what birds could be seen and heard within 50 meters of the transect, write all of those down, go another 100 meters, and, and do this uh, every five minutes and, until they got to the end of the transect. So then you would have a big list that told you what you saw at each point, and then you could pick out all of the independent observations, all of the, the novel ones, to get a, an overall species list of all the different species seen across that whole route. So the data were summarized across that transect, and then they looked within the list of birds to see which species were native and non-native, and which were migratory, and which were year-round. Now they also collected information on the environmental variables that were found within the yards that were being studied. And they did this by using a questionnaire to ask residents whether their front and back yards contained various different wildlife resources. And these included deciduous and evergreen trees, shrubs, plants with fruits and berries, flowers, herbs, and vegetables, uh, vegetation specifically planted because of, of the likelihood that it would attract birds, native vegetation, bird feeders and bird houses, water features, and also brush piles and open compost areas. And as you might imagine, there is some overlap there. So for example, you could have um, shrubs and also some of those shrubs might be native. So some of these things are a little bit redundant, but it's kind of thinking about the specifics of each one of those and um, the in ecological and environmental impact. So even though it might seem redundant to us when we look down that list, actually it has a very functional difference, each one of those things. So they asked about the yard activities as well. So for example, are people applying insecticides? Are they letting cats and dogs out? Things like that. And they distributed these questionnaires to about 1,800 residences and received answers from 924. So they had an average of 52% of residents responding to, per transect, which is actually really good because a lot of people tend to get questionnaires and surveys and then kind of toss them or they'll, they'll sit around forever and then they never get answered. And because I know this, because I've had friends that have done this sort of work and have just labored and labored and felt really depressed when they can't get any answers. I always try to um, respond to every survey I'm ever given. And so I find myself answering questions about uh, where I live, the trains that I travel on, the food that I eat, the hotels that I prefer, all sorts of things. And sometimes I think, why am I doing this? It seems really pointless, but if you think about it, this kind of stuff is actually really important and really useful. So if you ever get a chance, if someone ever comes up to you and asks you to fill out a survey, you should definitely help because the data that you give can be used in studies like this to make really important decisions. So sorry, that was a bit of a, a, bit of a tangent. Getting back on track, uh, the researchers aggregated the survey responses for each transect in order to determine the environmental characteristics, not just of each individual yard, but of all the yards within a particular area. And they used known data, so the answers that were given, to extrapolate and create estimates for the unknown data. So of course in a neighborhood if they're only getting about 52 percent of respondents then that means you've got 48 percent of yards that you don't really know the, the variables for. So they use this extrapolation to kind of fill in the gaps and then get the overall averages um, using that information for the whole neighborhood. Now the environmental variables um, then within neighborhoods and landscapes were measured in a slightly different way. So I guess I should clarify that up till now I've been kind of loosely losing, 
loosely using the term um, neighborhood. And what I really mean is the aggregated yards. And aggregated yards are different from neighborhoods because each yard space, basically, if you, if you think about a house with the, the green space out back and the green space out front, those are the green spaces for um, that particular house. And the next door might have some, and the next door might have some. And then you add all of the, those little bits up, and that gives you your aggregated space. Within the neighborhood, though, there might be other bits of green around. So maybe there's a school nearby, maybe there's a little strip of grass between someone's yard and the sidewalk, um, or between the sidewalk and the road. Maybe there's a median in the middle of the road and that has some green on it that might have some trees. So the neighborhood evaluation is going to include all of those other non-garden spaces as well. So it's a bit of a larger uh, categorization and includes a bit more space than just the aggregated yard. And I'll try to make sure I, I use those terms correctly from now on so I don't provide any kind of confusing explanations. So one goal was to determine the relative importance of decisions made about yards versus those made about the larger neighborhood and landscape. So this is the whole bottom-up, top-down thing. So they used GIS to calculate percent canopy cover and also percent vegetation within 50 meters of each transect. They calculated two landscape scale characteristics within the one kilometer buffer of each transect as well. And that was, first of all, amount of open space, and secondly, percent of canopy cover. And then they also calculated the distance to the nearest river. So those are pretty simple, larger scale uh, data points that they collected. And then they conducted a statistical analysis that allowed them to begin to think about the varying effects of um, all of these different features at the different landscape levels. So they defined seven candidate models that represented uh, the different spatial scales. So first of all, you've got the aggregated yard characteristics, then you've got the neighborhood characteristics, then you've got the landscape characteristics, then you've got aggregated yards plus neighborhood, aggregated yards plus landscape, neighborhood plus landscape, and then all three of them together. So basically, this is just, uh, each of these models then is, is including all of those data in order to see which of the seven models best explains the variations that they see in richness. If the best model, if the best mapping kind of is the aggregated yards, then you know that it's kind of the bottom up sort of thing that's having a real impact. If, on the other hand, you find that it's the landscape characteristics that most um, closely predict the bird richness, then you know it's those larger scale top-down sorts of things that are impacting the birds. The other models are a bit more complicated because they suggest that there are multiple environmental factors at multiple scales having an impact altogether. So they created all of these to see which one tracks best with the richness in order to figure out what is the scale that's impacting these animals. So they examined all yard characteristics to identify specific elements within groups of yards that might have bottom-up influences on native bird richness. So regardless of of the kind of large, medium, small spatial scale analysis, they also wanted to know within each yard, um, thinking about that aggregated yard impact, whatever it is, whether it's really strong or not, are there particular features that stand out as having a real influence? And they also explored how different species groups responded to the aggregated elements in yards. And to do this, they developed an index for each yard-related variable or for each bird species. And then looked to see what was the average value of a variable across all the transects where a species was present. So to explain that a little bit better, let's say, for example, that the Baltimore Oriole was found on eight different transects. So we know that one of the things that they surveyed for was to find out about whether cats were allowed out into the yard. So to calculate the outdoor cat index for the species, and they would do this calculation for each of the factors that they surveyed for, um, but let's focus on the cats. So they would then take the average number of outdoor cats for the eight transects where the species was seen, and then figure out whether uh, there was an effect of cats on Baltimore Orioles, and whether this was different from the effect of cats on uh, house finches, for example. So they would do this for all the different species and all the different factors in the yards to see whether there is this increasing or decreasing effect of the number of those factors on the species that are found there. They re-examined the indices looking at class of bird as well rather than species of bird. So is it the, a migrant? Is it a non-migrant? 
is it a native, is it a non-native? Okay, so those are all of the uh, methods. I may have made that a little bit more complicated than it needed to be, but hopefully you hung in there. And I'll give you another bit of a break to kind of process that, and then we'll come back and talk about what the authors actually found. Welcome to the Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Amanda Shires with The Garden Song. Now, in case you're just joining us, I'll quickly recap and tell you that we are talking about a study that was recently done looking at the effects of yards and aggregated yard space throughout a, a larger neighborhood and landscape level to, on uh, bird richness. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Amanda Shires with The Garden Song. Now, on today's show, in case you're just joining us, I'll recap really quickly and tell you that I'm talking about a recent study that was looking at the effect of garden space on bird richness in areas that are near to uh, preserves in the middle of an otherwise quite built-up uh, city area, and in this case, Chicago. Now, the authors went out and they conducted some surveys to look at bird richness. They also distributed questionnaires to people living in neighborhoods to find out what they did in their backyards and, and their front gardens and what sorts of features they had there. They used GIS to collect some larger scale data on whole neighborhoods and on landscapes. And then they created a bunch of models to explore basically whether top-down or bottom-up regulation of uh, the environment which one of these was having the bigger effect on wildlife and uh, on birds in particular. And do birds vary their responses depending on these different features within yards and also whether they are migrants versus non-migrants and natives versus non-natives. So that was a really quick summary through basically 30 minutes of show. So that shows you that I could have been a lot more succinct earlier. So what did they find after all this work? Well, a total of 36 species were seen during the study, and the most widespread were the American robin, which is quite like the blackbird here, uh, the American goldfinch, the northern cardinal, and the house sparrow. Eight species were observed at only one of all the different 25 transects. 20 species were migratory, 12 were year-round natives, and four were non-natives. Species richness across the transects ranged quite a bit from 11, which was the low, all the way up to 21, but the mean was about 16. So let's think about resources in front and backyards. 55% of respondents reported that they had vegetation with fruit or berries, and 34% indicated that they had a bird feeder. And of those, the vast majority, 81%, said that the feeders were filled at least several days per month, which indicates that they should be actually useful for the birds and kind of influencing bird activity in some way or another. So those are kind of the standout results of uh, the surveys. The average respondent indicated that his or her parcel included approximately six of the 11 wildlife resources that were listed in the questionnaire, which is uh, actually pretty good if you think about it. So that's quite a lot of features per yard that could potentially have a positive influence on uh, bird richness. So the next question the authors asked was what was the relationship between native bird species richness and spatial scales? So the model that best predicted the uh, richness of bird species was the one that represented only the aggregation of yard characteristics. So thinking about all of the garden slash yard space within a neighborhood added up, not counting any of the other green spaces in the neighborhood, just the yards themselves. And this explained just a little bit over 42 percent of the variance in the number of native bird species seen per transect. And 42 percent may not sound like a really large number to you because there's still 60 percent out there that's not really being explained, but in an ecological situation this is actually a really high value because there are lots of other things that you can't measure. So things like um, the soil, the insects, the micro habitats, so the temperature, the wind, uh, what was the rain like, what was the weather like. So um, when you're dealing with ecological factors like that, and it's just practically an infinite number of things that can influence results like these, a number that's above 25-30% is actually quite good and uh, is 
considered to be a, a really interesting trend that is kind of probably a, a pretty reliable estimate of what's going on out there. Now, richness was positively influenced by the average number of wildlife resources, so how many of those 11 things did people have? And it was negatively influenced, as you might imagine, by the number of outdoor cats. And those were the two really notable things that stood out as influencing this pattern. The second best supported model, which was not nearly as strong, was one that included a combination of both yard and neighborhood characteristics, and that probably is not a big surprise either, because in general, the overall neighborhood um, kind of aggregate probably isn't going to have a ton more green space than just the aggregated yards alone, but that probably varies quite a lot from one neighborhood to another. So what were the yard elements that were linked with native bird species rich species richness, it's very hard to say, uh, and in what direction. The analysis revealed eight models that kind of uh, explained the relationship between the aggregated yard characteristics and the native bird species richness. And all of these models, uh, on average, they kind of suggested about 47% of variation was impacted by these things. So cumulatively, again, that's quite a lot of variation that can be tracked just to these things. And the models will all have different factors entered into them, but all these eight models were pretty good at um, predicting the variation, and that's why the authors have looked at all of them in combination, because there's going to be a lot of overlapping characteristics in each of these models. So what are the factors that they collectively indicated were quite important? Well, ratio of evergreen to deciduous trees was the most important, and it had a positive impact on richness. Percentage of yards containing plants with fruit or berries was also positive. Uh, as was the percentage of yards with trees, which is not a surprise, it's kind of related to that first one. And then negative impacts were seen by uh, the number of outdoor cats and also the number of dogs and the percentage of yards with insecticide use. And you might have noticed that there are a couple of things there uh, that weren't included in my list that were in the original um, list of all the things that were asked about. And that's because uh, the number of bird feeders and the interaction between shrubs and trees, kind of the balance of, of small canopy versus large canopy, neither of those was found in any of the best models. So they don't appear to have a really strong impact on variations in bird richness. And that might surprise you because you might think that bird feeders would actually be quite important. Um, but it may be that in these spaces, the animals um, that are liking the areas the most are not seed eaters or that they just have plenty of native natural resources so they don't need to be supplemented, or some other factor um, that would need to be looked at in the future. Now, what were the yard characteristics linked with species groups rather than overall richness? First of all, there were differences between species groups for six of the nine variables. Percentage of yards with trees, ratio of evergreens to deciduous trees, percentage of yards with fruit and berries, average number of wildlife-friendly resources per yard, and number of dogs and also cats. So for these variables, the differences were observed between migratory birds and non-native species. So migratory birds were more frequently found on transects with more trees and yards, also with more plants that had fruit and berries, more wildlife resources, and higher ratios of evergreens to deciduous trees. Migratory birds were uh, found on transects with the fewest outdoor cats, which is not really a big surprise, so 3.2 versus 5.1 for exotic birds, and also the fewest dogs, so 24.4 versus 30.3, and that's a pretty big difference in the number of dogs and number of cats, so clearly the animals are noticing how many pets are around and they're either vacating because they're being scared off or the animals are out there chasing them and, and capturing them and eating them, and that's why the numbers are lower. There were no significant differences for bird feeders, for tree shrub interactions, or for insecticide use, surprisingly enough. So what does all of this mean? Well, it's clear that yard design and management has impacts on native birds in residential areas. And that's probably true not just in Chicago, but elsewhere as well. And this makes a strong case for resident matrix management, as the authors refer to it, and this is something that you can use as a real conservation strategy. So kind of thinking about the idea of thinking outside the park and not just assuming that all uh, conservation and preservation efforts have to happen within um, kind of a designated area, but in fact can spill over into areas that are used for other things as well.
the ecological value of cities can clearly be maximized by improving matrix quality and in considering yards along with other areas like parks and natural spaces. And in, in this case, matrix is thinking about all the different types of spaces that collectively add up to make the whole city. So that might be um, you know, a place where there's a bench where you might go have a picnic. It could be a skate park. It could be kind of an actual preserve. It could be a fountain outside of a business building. So there are all sorts of various things, and all of these add up and collectively make the bigger picture in the area. What the authors also found was that even minor yard enhancements can have beneficial effects. And this is the result of the aggregate effect of multiple yards. And what's nice about this is that it's a pattern that's known to inspire people to take part. So they don't feel that it's all up to them to do the right thing and to create this place. But by working together and doing a little bit from each one of them, then suddenly that adds up and they're all contributing all contributing, and all making a difference collectively as a group rather than individually. And fostering this kind of attitude can be uh, helped by efforts such as the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Yard Map and the National Wildlife Federation's Community Habitat Programs, which both facilitate community efforts. And I'm sure there are some um, analogs of those here in the UK as well. The research also shows that um, formal institutions such as homeowner, homeowners associations probably really have the power to facilitate the management of many species in the same way at the same time. So these groups that kind of overlook all these people in their yards could help promote certain ideas and help get people doing certain things. Likewise, municipal programs could provide incentives that would promote wildlife friendly management, like for example giving rebates if people purchase native trees or purchase any trees at all to plant in their yards. The nice thing about all of this is that Backyard biodiversity can have beneficial effects, not just on the animals that are out there, but also on people. So they tend to have improved well-being, better quality of life, they have a greater awareness and understanding of biodiversity, and also an increased interest in engaging with conservation efforts. So if you improve in, uh, the individual yard condition, then there can be this kind of uh, circular effect where someone does something in their yard that increases biodiversity and that makes them happy, it makes them feel part of the community and so they feel more interested in doing more of that and so it kind of spreads and goes around and around and around until we're all doing a lot and suddenly all of the animals have a better habitat to live in and better conditions to live in. Or at least that's the ideal. Uh, and so of course the study does suggest a few things that you can specifically do. So thinking about having more evergreens, uh, kind of I mean, all trees in general are good, but in particular planting a few more evergreens, keeping your cats and your dogs in the house, having plants that have fruits and berries. Uh, and, you know, all of this, of course, is going to vary from one ecological region to another, but those are some interesting rules of thumb to start with, play around with that, and see if it has an impact. Overall, the research does suggest that bottom-up influences the characteristics of residential yards in this case, do seem to have a real impact on urban biodiversity, which means not only that you can go out and make a difference, but that actually the people who are making the larger plans as well should be thinking about that and thinking about how they can engage you and what they can do and what um, effects your actions are going to have on that bigger plan. So they should see these little plots of land, your little garden, your little um, area that you've got set aside for yourself and think about how does that kind of fit in within a neighborhood and across the landscape to have this larger scale effect as well. So hopefully you now feel a bit informed, also a bit empowered, excited to go out as these days are hopefully getting a little bit warmer uh, and start planting some things and changing things around to make your garden, maybe your allotment, a bit more bird friendly. On that happy note, uh, I will leave you in the hands of Roseanne Cash singing of feathers, not a bird. Talk to you next week.